All right, let's get Dean up here. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us today from a land down under is Dean McRae, an Australian libertarian political candidate representing Australia's Liberal Democratic Party. Yeah, I know. It's screwy. We'll let him explain that. He's a chef, a business owner, and an entrepreneur, founder, and presenter of Resolute TV. I had the honor yeah. of being interviewed on his platform last week. Uh, also, Dissident Squad Media. And he's oh. just, a, you know, someone who you can tell is uh, really passionate about this message. And I'm, I'm excited not just to, to introduce you all to, to Dean, but to, uh, to, to take advantage of this opportunity to get a sense of, what the fuck is happening in Australia? Dean, welcome to Adam versus the Man. Hi, Adam. How you going? Excellent. We got you in real time. So, Dean. We're here, mate. We're here. To, <laughs> welcome to Adam versus the Man. How are you doing this morning? I guess it's not morning in Australia, is it? Oh, no. It's, it's well and truly morning. It's 3 a.m. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dean, for making the effort to join us live, for hanging, us, hanging with us. And uh, I, I hope you appreciated that introduction. You know, before we get into how badly Australia has screwed things up over the coronavirus, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your, your uh, libertarianism in Australia, what, what it means to run with a party that's not the Libertarian Party and, uh, and your Micronation project there. <laughs> Mate, look, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It was nice nice to catch you, nice to meet up with you. Uh, I've got to apologise about the tech issues. We put a whole bunch of new cameras and stuff in thinking this would be brilliant. Unfortunately, I can't make myself look much prettier than what I what I do and what I am. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm actually a member of the Australian version of the Libertarian Party, uh, the, the Liberal Democrats, that's behind me. Uh, the name's... Uh, look, we get a bit, of, a bit of heat for the name. I wasn't there when they invented it, but that's what we call our Libertarian Party here in Australia. We currently have three uh, MLCs, three, three members of parliament um, over here, and they're doing an absolutely fantastic job considering everything that's happening. They are being the voice of good sense, good reason, and holding all of the other totalitarians to account. So uh, we're really proud of them. So that's, that's great. Uh, the Micronation Project, that's a, that's a bit of a funny one. So obviously you were speaking to Dia the other day. Uh, what happened was I started doing a bit of research, as a lot of us in the libertarian space do, mate, and, you know, looking for alternatives and things like that. We actually had a fellow, he died a couple of years ago, called uh, Prince Leonard of Hutt, and he sort of seceded from Australia. Um, they had a dispute over wheat and quotas and, you know, government generally doing what they do best. And he succeeded. He got away with it for about 30 years. And um, now that he's, he's sort of passed on, his family seemed to have gone, oh, shit, how do we deal with this? Uh, which is a bit disappointing. But it sort of got me thinking, you know, what can we do in and around this space? And um, I've been involved or I'm now involved in the Lieberland project. I don't know if you're familiar with yes, that, Adam. But excellent. Yeah. So actually their, their flag's up on the, on the wall behind me as well. Um, yeah. I've taken on a bit of a role as the Lieberland uh, representative for Australia. Uh, so I do my bit with the Liberal Democrats. I do my bit with Resolute TV, which is sort of, uh, and thank you for appearing the other day. It was great. That goes live this week or the first portion of it. Um, it was sort of a bit of an attempt to, you know, create something in Australia similar to what you, you guys, yourself, Dan Berman. I met Dan as well online. He was really great and put me onto you, which I really appreciate the work you guys do. And I felt like, I feel like we all, you know, we're in the same vibe, we feel the same things and we feel the same frustrations. So, um, you know, I'm trying to build this little platform. It's modest to start with, but I've had some really great guests. Um, yourself, Larry Larry Sharp, Dan Berman, uh, Jeffrey Tucker from the Australian Institute of Economic Education Resources. Um, you know, I've really been, been fortunate to have the guests that I've had and I've been involved in the libertarian movement here for about five years, which is when I discovered what a libertarian was. Um, we don't, we, you know, there's just not that vibe over here like I think you guys get where you're sort of always looking for a label. Uh, and when I sort of worked, I, I'd always been against, not against government, but against all the stuff that they do. And I found a lot of injustice and it really frustrated me. Where do I look? And then I found these guys and I sort of found a bit of a home and I found my personality is a relative, relatively good tool 
Um, in the freedom space, certainly in Australia, where people know who I am. They don't all love me, but they'll know who I am one, one way or the other. Now, Dean, uh, as a typical American, I, I'm ignorant of the rest of the world and shocked to hear that there's a, there, there's a, there are three libertarian members of parliament in Australia. But as a libertarian, I have to go, how libertarian can a party be if they call themselves the Liberal Democratic Party? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I don't mean to discount this because I think it's, it's all awesome. And if there's an umbrella party, but in the United States, it's absolutely written into the Libertarian Party statement of principles, uh, sort of an irrevocable part of our, our documentation, our, our platform. Uh, that would, uh, by the way, it's, it would require a seven eighths vote of our delegates at a national convention to overturn. It really is baked in to the DNA of our party that, that we respect the non aggression principle in our statement of principles. And it is, it is a, uh, you know, a lot of people who see libertarian candidates doing different things misjudge the libertarian party in the U.S., but we are absolutely at our core committed to those ethical principles. Does the Liberal Democratic Party in Australia have that same grounding? Mate, look, we really do. And obviously with my research into you guys, as I've been developing and learning and I'm on a, as you've sort of probably started to discover recently, I'm really on this this trajectory. And we, we, we have two really core philosophies that all of our members of parliament, when they do get elected and councils and things like that, hold, hold true. And we will never, ever support or vote for an increase in, in taxes of any sort. So it doesn't matter what, what, the, what the arrangement is, if, if any other party puts forward a, a desire for more tax, we're an instant no. It's not even worth discussing with us. And if, it's, if it limits people's personal freedoms, we're out. It, uh, under no circumstances, we're, we're just going, no, sorry, we're not going to take, take personal freedoms away from anybody and we will never vote to support it. Uh, we did have another, we actually had a federal senator. So the MLC guys we've got are at state level. Um, and we actually had a federally elected politician, David Lionhelm, who uh, did some amazing, amazing work over here. He really opened the door. He kind of got me interested in the party. Uh, and and to, to his credit, he's been fairly good at teaching me many good things, as, along with David Limbrick, Tim Quilty and Aaron Stonehouse. They're our four, four elected officials that we've had uh, fighting the good fight. And you will never find anywhere in any voting history whereby an elected official from the Liberal Democrats has supported either of those two things. Other things they negotiate where they must. Um, you know, we're sort of, we, I, I, it's, it's a funny dynamic for the American viewer. Our Liberal Party here is our Conservative Party. Our version of a Democratic type party or your, you guys' Liberal Party is what we call the Labor Party or the Greens. You, we, you guys have a Greens Party as well. And um, so it's sort of opposite and it makes no sense. So our Liberal Party claim to be conservatives, which to me, they're not even close to conservative, which annoys me as well, because at least if you're going to be a conservative, just say you're a conservative. But they're a very, very left-leaning conservative party, and I've had a few fallouts with them. Um, well, hold on, Dean, Dean I, I, I would actually uh, differ with you on this. On, on, I think you're falling for the Americanized false definition of conservative, of having anything to do with small government. The definition of conservative and its traditional meaning in politics is to conserve existing social institutions. Well, when existing social institutions are socialist, communist, and fascist, <laughs> conservatives are now socialist, communist, and fascist, right? So I, I think, you know, I mean, again, you know, politics is full of lies and bullshit and distortion. And, you know, it's it, just, just crossing the ocean, you see how terms are used in, in totally different ways. You say that it's screwed up relative to the American system. Well, I, th I thought it was the Americans who screwed up the British system. Well, in a way, we improved on it by not having a king and instead having a clown for a front man while the king's power oligopoly is still in effect behind him. Um, so, like, we have a better illusion and it's simpler to understand. And see, that's the thing is like in, in a lot of these parliamentary countries that are, uh, you know, com uh, um, British Commonwealth uh, countries or, or former Commonwealth countries, they had a system that mimicked uh, the British system and then slowly got away from it. Whereas in the United States, historically, with the, with the revolution, at least there was a clean break and a sort of reset. We're going to do things our own way. Um, 
But, I mean, we call it football. The rest of the world or, you know, call, calls it American football. Don't get yeah. me started on rugby versus soccer versus American football. But, no, <laughs> you don't have to take responsibility for Americans having their terminology backwards. But, yes, thank you. you know, we, do, we do have to stop and define terms uh, just to have this, yeah. this kind of international political conversation because we both operate in – different environments dominated by different propaganda and different terminology. But I think the key element there, though, that you hit on is our principles, our code of ethics, and I have a feeling that ours, yours and mine and uh, a lot of other people's line up in that freedom space where the, the no harm principle is the core is the core philosophy. I'm not going to hit you, I'm not going to harm you, I'm not going to hurt you, but you need to leave me alone as well. And right. that's, you know, for me, that's a, that's a really big thing. And... I don't think it matters which which uh, color of communist or socialist we're dealing with. They're they're just as bad in both both countries. And I think the entire Western world is sort of, to be fair, de derive some version of the British system. We certainly are. I mean, we were a convict nation, uh, which I think is probably a good reflection of what we're going through now, uh, with all these lockdowns and the madness of the of the the coronavirus or the coronavirus mm -hmm. or the China virus or the the, what is it, the, the uh, Wuhan flu, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, it's, I don't want to say the virus doesn't exist or anything because I'm not a doctor, but I certainly think the response to it has been absolutely over the top. All right, so, you know, I, 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 would, I wanted to jump ahead, Dean, and ask you, well, hey, Dean, with all these elected libertarians in Australia, how did you fuck things up so bad? But let's let's play a different game. If you'll indulge me for a few minutes, we we got you at least for for the to, to, for another thirty here. Um, there's a link that I really love to share, and I don't know anything else about this this website. I just have this. There's this one great article here, and it's it's from the website laissezfairerepublic.com. Ten planks, the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. 194 or excuse me 1848 by Karl Heinrich Marx. And anybody who tries to tell me that Trump is not a communist, I tell them I, I go, well, how communist is the institution that he heads up and perpetuates that he's growing? And yeah. you know of, of the 10 planks of the communist manifesto, how many of them are in effect in the United States? And I I, I love playing this. So let's let's play this game with like the the U.S. versus Australia edition. Which country is more communist? I think we can get through this. And, and let's see, we do ten planks in ten minutes. I'm all and in, then, mate. And then, and then we'll know. <laughs> we'll know why possibly Australia fucked up its coronavirus response so bad. So, number one, abolition of private property and land and application of all rents of land to public purpose. Now in the United States, a lot of people will 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 argue with this one. Well, you can own property, you can own land. It's like where in the United States can you own land without paying property tax? Yep. Where in the United States can you own land by consent of your community as opposed to by government permission? And if it's by government permission, it's in a situation where you're going to be paying property tax on it. And so the story of the article says the courts have interpreted the 14th Amendment to give the government far more eminent domain power than it was originally intended. Oh, yeah. And then there's that sticky problem of eminent domain. Right. Yes. Uh, in the United States, basically any government agency can claim any land they want at any time for eminent domain. Your vehicles, the way they are registered, actually make them property of the government. Um, and can be forfeited under provisions of the RICO statutes. And, of course, the so-called war on drugs, if you get pulled over in the United States uh, or, or raided or uh, have a home invasion by the police, police can seize any of your property at any time based on saying that it is uh, it, it could be evidence or something that was used in a crime or profit from a crime. And cops do this every day. There is more property in the United States stolen by police than non-police in terms of value. Uh, how does Australia measure up on that count? How are you doing for private property there? I oh, know we're, we're, we're communists with you guys right right there, mate. We're right in the middle of it. So there's absolutely nothing that we can 
own without paying paying taxes, like you know, property taxes with the, the government. Um, one of my really, really good friends, uh, an assistant on here, and this fits right into what you've just said, got a letter and he rings. I, I get the phone calls. You probably get many of the same. This has happened. What do I do? And he, he read me this letter uh, from our local councils. So in Australia, we have three tiers of government. We've got local councils, just as bad as big councils, but they, you know, they're localised, state counts, uh, state governments, and then we have federal government. The, he, his mother, 87-year-old woman, gets this letter from the council. Your lawn is too long. Um, it's over 10 centimetres high. It's, um, you know, there's too many weeds. It could cause a fire. Um, you know, all this sort of nonsense. And she, she's had a meltdown. She's an 87 year old, nearly deaf, deaf, deaf woman. Um, you know, lovely lady. And she's got this, and, and they send these letters. And it's not quite a gun to your head, but when you're an 87 year old woman and you get this letter and it looks formal and there's all the big words and there's all the BS that goes with it. And she had a meltdown. She rang him. He rang me. We've decided it. We wrote a response. I might even email you a copy of the response. You might enjoy it. But, you know, we're in exactly the same boat, mate, these guys. Now, the, to, in, in our world, if you're concerned about a uh, little old lady's front yard or backyard, I don't know about you, Adam, but I'd go knock on the door and say, darling, you look like you're struggling to keep up. Is there anything I can do to help? If I've got an issue with it, would you like me to mow your lawn for you or do you want me to find a kid who'll do it for 10 bucks a, a go? But these blokes, no, they don't do that. They don't offer that. So what we also did was we went around town, like the, the community we're living in, with cameras and we took photos of all the government property that they own or are responsible for that's that's completely overgrown and looks like shit as well. And we attached like 30 photos and we said, so what we will be doing is we'll be checking back with it, it, in with you in 14 days to see whether you've dealt with these issues in the same manner that you've expected uh, this nice old lady to. Thank you very oh, much. Yeah, that's brilliant, man. And, and yeah, so I, I, so I guess it's that, that you have a, a similar to the United States, you have a partial illusion yeah. of private property. And I, I imagine that that when an older person, uh, as in that case, gets a letter like that, it's not that they're overwhelmed and confused by the big words. It's that they know that behind certain big words used by government, there's a fucking gun. <laughs> there's a fucking gun. That is yep. comply, or we will force you to comply. And anyway, all right. So let's get on. The next one, we got to get through this list. Uh, all right, all right. A heavy progressive or graduated income tax is the second plank of the Communist Manifesto. Obviously, we have that here in the United States. And when you point that out to people, it's like, oh yeah, that is kind of an essential element of communism, isn't it? You have you have a similar tax. Structure for income, graduated, progressive, all that in, in Australia, I presume. I made a little video, mate. We've got over 125 different taxes, stamp duties, um, tariffs, you name it, uh, that the Australian people pay annually. So there's over 125, and the Australian Revenue website couldn't name all of them definitively. So they're just making the shit up as they go along. The Australian Taxpayers Alliance, which um, do really good work over here, I think they've calculated when it all comes into the average Australian pays about 58% tax, you know, across the board. So your car red, Joe, that nobody sees as a tax, uh, uh, this or that. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're yeah, right I'm, there with the Communist Party. I'm glad, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it with that number because we have a similar statistic in the United States where, and I, I say this over and over, although it's probably higher now, that for the average working American, when you add up your income taxes, all your other withholdings, all the other normal average fees, fines, costs, and hidden taxes of government, you are working for government over half the year. We celebrate Tax Freedom Day. Uh, there's, there's a think tank that figures that out and goes, oh, yeah, on this day, you stopped working for the government and finally started working for yourself and your family and your community. And you go, oh. Fuck, that's been a, it's been a long year already. All right, so the next one, and this is one that is partially in effect in the United States, abolition of all rights of inheritance. And what we're talking about here is estate taxes and inheritance taxes. And to be fair, Republicans in the United States have put up a, a, a pretend fight against this in fighting the, the death tax. And that's gr brilliant reframing. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that we're, completely uh, communist on this count, but at least partially in the sense that uh, rights of inheritance uh, are, are limited for most people, except for the super elites. 
Yeah, well, we used to have a, a death tax. You know, I'm sure all the the wording in the in the things are slightly different, but we had one. It got abolished, to my understanding, and now there are big calls, of course, uh, to bring it back. It's very important. Coronavirus has damaged the economy so far that well, we need to we need to um, we need to raise funds somehow. The government's been giving all this money away, free money. We're we're looking after you. Where, where are we going to get that back? So you yeah, know, we're we're kind of we're. If we haven't actually got it, but we've had it, so we're probably similar to you guys. There, we're not quite. It's not okay, locked. Okay, well, in. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to hold you on this one. You don't get the point. So right now, the score is two and a half for the U.S. to two for <laughs> Australia. All right. So number four, confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels. We call it government seizures, tax liens, forfeiture, public law, executive order one one four nine zero. Blah 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 which gives private land to the Department of Urban Development, the imprisonment of terrorists and those who speak out right against the government, or the IRS confiscation of property without due process. So like on this count, I, you know, confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels, uh, in terms of people you know, leaving the United States, uh, you know, you have to pay, you can't leave with your money. Uh, you, you have to uh, you, you have to pay ten thousand dollars to renounce your citizenship, or or some portion of that, or if and if you leave with so you have to convert it to Bitcoin, send it overseas, then leave the country, then mm. then convert it back to avoid the the tax of leaving the United States. But I yeah, I would give us a, I would give us a half point on this one. I would you say about the same for Australia. Yeah, mate, half half point. Look, as, as a general rule, here's how we work. We steal ideas from the British and the Americans. We're, we're 200 odd years behind you guys as a country. We didn't have an armed rebellion. We had we basically were a concentration camp prison to start with. So there's an awful lot of stuff. We just we just follow you guys along and tow the tow the line. So yeah, mate, probably half a point's fair there as well. All right. So so America here so far at uh, three out of four points possible on its communism scale australia struggling struggling behind a two and a half to three points all right number five centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly duh in the united states we have the federal reserve system we have uh, a whole corrupt fractional reserve based banking system that has sprung up around that certainly that credit the general system of credit is controlled by the state through the Federal Reserve Act. Um, I, 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 I think we get the full point on this one. How, how's Australia doing? Do you have, do you have free market money in Australia? Uh -huh, no, nothing even close, mate. Nothing even close. Now, of course, our dollar is linked to your dollar on the news every night. It's all this, this, the Australian dollar will buy X amount of US dollars, like everything else. We're all fiat. Uh, Bitcoin is very much frowned upon. Uh, by our masters and overlords, uh, they—I I mean, there are there are cases of people being arrested for having having unauthorized and undeclared Bitcoin. How dare you? We uh, we don't know about it. Therefore, we are—you know—you're obvious. Obviously, you're dealing in proceeds of crime. So, well, no, obviously, I just don't want to buy and sell with terrorists. Um, I don't want to participate with you guys. Leave me alone. But that's yeah. No, we're we're all in on that one, mate. All right, so on the scale of communism now, America is four out of five. Australia, three and a half out of five. Uh, number six here, centralization of the means of communication and transportation in the hands of the state. We have here the Federal Communications Commission, which means you cannot broadcast anything without permission of government. Obviously, somewhat altered in the era of the Internet. Uh, transportation, we have uh, the... Uh, Interstate Commerce Commission and the Federal Aviation Administration and the Department of Transportation and not not to mention the federal monopolies, the federal postal monopoly, but also Amtrak and Conrail, outright socialist enterprises. So uh, on this one, I mean, I, I, I you, you I, I'd be uh, there's some things that hold me from from giving it the full point. But when you say, well, the federal government withholds permission for all of these things then uh yeah i think i think we get the point here for the united states you about the same in australia yeah, we're, we're, we're the same mate we just have different names for the for each different group that you've got to uh, bend the knee to to be able to drive a car use a road or, or whatever else here mate we're, we're we're in there with you all right so we we're up to five out of six and four and a half out of six for australia 
Number seven, <clears throat> extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state, the bringing into cultivation of wastelands and the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with the common plan. So the, the article says here, while the U.S. does not have vast collective farms, which failed so miserably in the Soviet Union, we nevertheless do have a significant degree of government involvement in agriculture in the form of price support subsidies, acreage allotments, and land use controls. The Desert Entry Act and the Department of Agriculture, Department of Commerce and Labor, Department of the Interior, Environmental Protection Agency, Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Reclamation, National Park Service, and the IRS control of business through corporate regulations. And this does not even mention the fact that the federal government of the United States of America claims to own over 50% of the land in the United States west of the Mississippi and a big chunk east of the Mississippi as well. So here, yeah, we get the point, 100%. Yeah, yeah, we'll take a point there, mate. We've got a thing called the Murray-Darling Basin Plan where I think, I think China owns about 10% of the water in Australia, which we've got, we've got farmers that don't have water. We've had, uh, we've had uh, drought. You know, we, we get droughts and all that sort of stuff. Our farmers struggle to get water. Uh, but, yeah, we've, we've sold off plenty. A lot of our politicians, although, although they won't announce it, own water rights. Uh, so yeah, no great big, great big disaster over here as far as that's concerned. The Murray Darling Basin Plan. If you want to give yourself five minutes of a of a complete complete joke, jump on and have a look at that, mate. It's fantastic. All right, so we're keeping up here. Uh, the United States now six out of seven to Australia's five and a half out of seven okay. communism points. Number eight, equal obligation of all to work. Establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. Now this sounds like. Well, we don't have e equal obligation of all to work. There are plenty of people who, who live on welfare in the United States. But here, as, the, as this points out, we call the Social Security Administration and the Department of Labor, the national debt and inflation caused by the communal bank has caused the need for a two-income family. Yeah. How did we get to that point? Women in the workplace since the 20s, the 19th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, Civil Rights Act of 1964, assorted socialist unions, affirmative acts in the Federal Public Works Program, and of course, Executive Order 11,000, and I almost forgot the Equal Rights Amendment, meaning that women should do all work that men do, including the military, and since passage, it would make women subject to the draft. So, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, we get the point. Yeah, we're, sure. yeah, yeah, we, we don't have an out-and-out -out draft, uh, but I have no doubt there's a there's a uh, proclamation in there somewhere in the fine print saying if we feel the need, we'll put that gun to your head and send women, children, and men to war. You know, no doubt. All right. So, what, you want to, you want to take half a point for Australia on that one? No, oh, no, no. We'll take full point. We'll we'll take, take okay. Full all point. right. Okay. So, yeah, so we got no we idea. got we got America at seven out of eight. And Australia is still, still trailing behind six and a half out of eight communist points. Now, number nine, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country by a more equitable distribution of the population over the country. Now, actually here in the United... Now, so here they cite the Planning Reorganization Act of 1949, zoning super corporate farms, executive orders, to create regions and, and, and public law. Now, I, I would actually think that in the United States, I, I think the communists have kind of changed their plan on this one, honestly, where there's there's more of a globalist desire to herd people into cities rather than distribute the population. And on this one, I'm, I'm not going to take the point for the U.S. I, I don't, I mean, combination of agriculture, manufacturing, there's some of that. Um, but in terms of a, a, an attempt to, distribute population over the country. Now, I think the trend of city concentration, I'm, I'm going to say America doesn't get the point on this one. We, we're still, at, we we're now at seven out of nine. Well, how about Australia? Oh, did we lose? Did we just I, lose Dean? Yeah, I think, we, I think we've had a technical issue. He, he uh -oh. commented in the private chat and said, you were frozen, but you're not, obviously. And he's reconnecting okay. right now. So okay, short, maybe short interruption, he's back. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it should should just be him. Uh, yeah, now so Dean, sometimes the screen freezes in uh, in in Streamyard, especially I'm sure with an international connection. I'll, you can just wait it out. If you can hear me, we can just keep going. You don't need to I see me. Are you there? I can hear you. You there? I hear you great. Yeah, I hear yeah. you great. Pretty sure it's the Australian federal government, and the U.S. federal government are having a chat going. We can't let these guys connect. This is bullshit. Not happening. That's the only just. All right. All right. 
Yeah, they're having they're having a communism off. All right, but let's get let's back to point number nine. Uh, does the Australian government seek uh, to manipulate the distribution of the population over the country? Mate, every every chance they get, and uh, they're doing more and more of it. Uh, it's it's done insidiously as they normally do, you know. Like, and but the coronavirus is actually a big uh, catalyst for it. They're using bringing in a lot of things at the moment, a lot of rules, a lot of uh, benefits. If you go X, if you go Y, if you go here, geographically we've got. Um, I think we're only um, a few square million shy of what the US has in square kilometres. Uh, but population, you guys have about 331 million and we have 26 million. So there's an awful lot of land to cover with not very many people in the scheme of things. So, yeah, they like to like to try to manipulate where people can go and, and why. So how much of a point do you want to give Australia on this one? No, look, a full one, because at the moment they're actually starting to bring in an awful lot of uh, really sneaky little things. We, we, we never actually realised we had borders until this stuff started, mate, like between state lines. I mean, they were there. But nobody yeah. had, ever, had ever had any sort of inclination that they existed. So All right, well, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this with the Corona checkpoints. We have we have just enough time. We're going to be able to get into all of that now. I so so this is this takes the United States down. I see. I with the U.S. I there's so much manipulation. I I would want to give us like a quarter of a point on this, and, yeah. and that way I can still say in the U.S. we at least have all planks partially manifest. But I, I'll, I'll concede here, and I won't take a point for the United States here, but we'll, we'll give a full point to, uh, to Australia for that if, if you want. So now we're at – you've just taken the lead. Australia is at 7.5 out of 9 to 7 out of 9 communist points against America. But we got one more here, number 10, free education for all children in government schools. Abolition of children's factory labor in its present form, combination of education with industrial production, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, obviously in the United States, oh, yeah, we got that point. Free education for all kids in government schools. You want free daycare to poison your kids' minds? We got you covered. How about Australia? Yeah, mate, it's all, all pretty well free here. Um, and by definition of free, you and I both know that it's not really free. We're all we're all paying for it. Um, but yeah, in their in their definition of it, I have people arguing with me all the time. Oh, but you wouldn't have free education, and I'm going. I'm not sure you understand what the word free means. But yeah, mate, it's pretty sad, really. It's heartbreaking. Wow. All right. No, no. Very, very well said. So I, I guess that that completes our 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 main <laughs> round of this communism contest. With the United States weighing in with eight points, we are we are eight out of ten on the communism scale, barely edged out by Australia with eight and a half. But I, you know what? There's I, I want to introduce a bonus round for this because I want the U.S. to win here. I'm I'm proud of my country. Yeah, yeah, I'm, for sure. <laughs> like America, so great again, no? What's that? Make America great again? No, I watched you. Yeah, debate. right. Well. <laughs> Here's here's the bonus question for you, Dean, because I'm pretty sure most communists, or at least communist governments, don't want their countries armed. How much are you allowed to own a gun as an Australian citizen? How many arguments have you had with people over the years how, how America should follow the Australian gun laws? We are not allowed to have guns, essentially. Uh, in I think 1996 we had we had a massacre. Now I've got friends who have written books suggesting that the massacre was not as legitimate as the government made out. Uh, and then they had what they decided was a buyback scheme, which indicated that we will give you a little bit of money for any guns that you may may or may not hold, uh, as long as you hand them over to us. If not, we will come to you with our guns and we will forcibly take them. Uh, and we we now uh, we we can get guns via. A uh, lot, very, very strict licensing policies. The average Australian citizen's probably never seen a gun. Um, yeah, no, we're sitting ducks, mate. If if need be, they'll. Uh, yeah, we're sitting sitting ducks. There's no no nobody around here that knows how to have a gun. And I'm I'm even ashamed to say that I think I fired a gun twice in my life as a as a passionate libertarian. I've never really needed to. When I was a kid, Dad had guns. Our gun laws are embarrassing, really. I, I look at the stuff that's been going on and I go, thank God the Americans all still have guns. <laughs> it's about the only thing <laughs> I right. think 
Oh, hold on. You're jumping ahead again, Dean. Don't worry. I promise. We are going to talk. And this is all like, this is all critical prelude to the last few minutes of the interview because you're about to understand exactly why Australia fucked things up so bad. Because in the United States, except for felons like me, which do make up a significant portion of the population, Americans are by and large allowed to own guns. So congratulations, you get the 10 bonus points for this round. And <laughs> Australia clearly wins the communism contest against the United States. Congratulations, Dean. And to all the other residents of Australia, you are that much more communist than the United States. Now, by the planks of the Communist Manifesto, though, I think it was a really cool thought exercise for us to go through there and say, oh, yeah, uh, America, we are uh, we, we got, you know, at least we're, we're at least 80 percent communist. Mm. I mean, you really drill down. What is what does communism look like? Pretty much like this. Yeah. You know, what does uh, you know, what does it look like in Australia? Eh, half a point worse. And with all the lockdowns and shutdowns that we've seen, and by the way, um, it's funny that we called it that Trump is, I think he's referred to this as the communist virus at one point, or the, the Chinese virus, the, the Kung flu, um, all very funny. But the real government flu that we've all got is communism. Yeah. And so how we are all vulnerable to manipulation based on fear over a virus with a lower mortality rate than trying to spend a counterfeit $20 bill in Minneapolis these days. So, Dean, the issue of firearms has been brought up a, a number of times recently with protests brewing in Australia being put down by police, where in the United States, when you have a protest and police are going, they have to, they have to assume there could be armed people in the crowd. In Australia... Is it true that when, when police are facing down protesters, they feel so much safer because they can push people around and go, well, at least we're not going to get shot? Mate, as, as heartbreaking as it is to say, the police here can essentially do what they want to our citizens, when they want, how they want. And I'd say 90% of the time, there's absolutely bugger all. And bugger all is an Australian term for, you know, not much you can do about it, really. It's just, uh, it's really embarrassing stuff that's been going on down in the protests. We've had, obviously, the Socialist Republic of Victoria. Uh, they've been they've been under the strictest lockdowns. Uh, the Premier down there, him and, um, you know, Karl Marx are very, very good friends, I'm sure. And by contrast, our other Premiers in the other states certainly aren't faring much better. And it's a, it's a you know, it's a, it's, what, what is it? You know, you're picking between two evils. Well, how much evil do you want? I don't want any of it. So, yeah, our, our citizens have been batted around. I did an episode on Resolute TV with or a couple of different episodes with various people who have been arrested or, as they pointed out, kidnapped for protesting. We've had, we've had um, people's homes raided and them arrested for posting online about, um, about protests coming up. You know, we should all go and protest this. Uh, the Stasi show up at people's houses. They dragged a pregnant mother out of her house at one stage for incitement. Uh, a former Australian veteran, he was pulled out of his house, you know, on the toilet pretty well. There's a whole video of it that kind of went a bit viral uh, for, again, incitement. Uh, we've had people in different states arrested. Uh, Renee Altacritti, she, uh, her and her son were out walking uh, with a placard on, you know, exercising our rights. Uh, and uh, she was rat pack stacked, thrown in the back of a, back of a paddy wagon, uh, and, and that was in the first lot of lockdowns in New South Wales, which is sort of the state that I'm in, but I'm a bit more regional, so I'm not quite as directly in the firing line with these guys at the moment. But, mate, some of the stuff going on is just disgusting and nothing we can do about it. Now, I, I do have to apologise a little bit to uh, to the audience. And, Dean, if you don't mind sticking around for a few extra minutes, uh, I'd like to give them a chance to ask some of these questions because they, they, they've heard me talk about uh, the the apartment complex that was turned into a, a prison for quarantine. Yep. Um, you know they've heard me talk about some of these protests that you that you mentioned. Uh, we we covered the the story of uh, the the woman who was just uh, just dragged out of her car essentially for having a camera and yep. and uh, I mean the the 
what we tell people to be afraid of in terms of the police state it's not like society itself is going to be radically transformed overnight in a way that you see it obviously happen. But when we see the American versions of this, we go, look, just around the corner, it could be a lot worse. So, Jim, if you could uh, check out comments and questions for Dean and what's going on in Australia, I want to read one from the Producers Club that Kim, uh, Kim shared with us. Uh, how could one how could one ask for a more perfect day that sadly would involve my family and friends in Melbourne no longer being imprisoned, impoverished and humiliated by their communist supporting state government who, while claiming a precise 66 percent approval of their dictatorship, are moderating the comments on their social media accounts to magically and precisely reflect that approval rate that's mate that's what i have and and that state that we're talking about victoria melbourne that's actually a state that does have two libertarian members of parliament and they're fighting it publicly they're they're the guys who are coming out and saying this is bullshit you cannot lock these people down this is un it's uncom our constitution is nowhere near as I suppose as valuable to the Australian people as it is to you guys. You guys sort of live and die by it to a point, mate. It's yeah, it's disgusting. They're they're not allowed at the moment uh, outside a five kilometre radius of their home. Uh, so if you want to exercise, and they've just started releasing all these things because there was a big blow up the other day. So the premier down there, they what they use is emergency orders to to be able to lock everybody up. Uh, the premier down there, a known communist, he loves that shit. Uh, Oh, well, we've got emergency powers. Everybody needs to be locked down. We've got to keep you all in your cage. This is what's happening. They use the emergency powers. Now, they've done some interviews with him recently and all the, all the rest. So the police chief, the medical chief officer, all the people who are supposed to be um, overlooking these things. So that's what the, the um, emergency orders are supposed to allow is him to operate with their at their guidance. None of, none of them know who made any of these decisions. The hotels that they've had locked down, um, you know, you're flying, you've got to isolate in a hotel that you've got to pay for, of course. Um, they're locking people up. They hired a, a bit of a woke security company to keep everybody in these prisons looked after. It turned out that um, none of them were really qualified or had any idea what they were doing. And it turned out that guards were sleeping with the, with the prisoners and, you know, all this sort of nonsense. And then, of course, there was another big outbreak of coronavirus, which Mate, the whole thing is just so fast. If we made a movie about it, nobody would believe it. You'd go, this is fiction, but this is happening down in the south of Australia. It's just terrifying, some of it, mate. All right. Uh, Jim, do we have any comments or questions? All right, look at this already, popping them up on screen. Uh, Dondre S. writes, Dean, how proactively, as an American, countering COVID hysteria, fear, and propaganda, how can we help Australia? Writing letters, petitions, what can we do to help you in the UK? Mate, from what I understand, uh, your president uh, or prime minister in the UK, he's heading down a similar path. I was sort of watching Boris Johnson the other day talking about we'll bring the military out into the streets if you guys don't do as, as, as you're told. I think, look, we can all write letters to members of parliament, but we know that, you know, it'd be like writing a letter to Joe Biden or Donald Trump saying, please don't be a communist. And as we've just discovered, they all sort of are whether they admit it or not. I think it's these platforms, the liking, the sharing, the, the, in, the closest thing we can do to independent media to wake people up and share, share these ideas, um, get them out there. Uh, clearly, certainly from an Australian perspective, is the politicians don't listen to the people at all. And as the previous commenter mentioned, they do. They, they do um, doctor the stats. If, if you know, uh, Dia Beltran, who you interviewed the other day, Adam, um, or, or she interviewed you, whatever, whatever the story was, She's from Victoria. She's currently banned from just about everything. Um, she can't she can't access her Facebook and her, her whatever. So the hardest part to do is build these sort of communities and these uh, united fronts across countries with similar problems, and then we try to help each other. It's you know I could write letters all day, and I know they're not going to listen. They go straight in the waste paper basket. Or what we get from our members of parliament is we get a stand, stock standard email reply saying. Thank you. Our well, Member of Parliament has noticed that you've sent us a letter. We will get back to you sometime in the next century. Uh, you know, so it's, it's a scary time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, about that, Dean, I, I do want to, before we get to the next question, I, I, if I may, 
I, I do want to take a second to try to answer that myself because it it's tempting. I mean, Americans as privileged citizens of the empire, we see suffering around the world and we genu genuinely want to help. And it's one of the great tragedies is that the goodwill of humanity and Americans in particular is destroyed through foreign aid and militarism by our government. But, you know, this, this sentiment of, of wanting to help, I, I kind of want to say, you know, we need to get our own house in order first. Um, th there are places around the world where people are suffering a little more distinctly, uh, but I don't think acutely with Corona. And, and, and if I look at Australia and the UK, I'm not nearly as worried about them as I am about people in the Philippines where mask deniers or people who were caught without masks were now forced to dig graves for Corona victims. And for yeah. dead bodies. And, you know, where, where like in India, you had people getting beaten in the streets for noncompliance. There are a lot of, like, I think it, even in Australia, as, as bad as things are and as good as that is for a comparison to the United States, in terms of a target of our sympathy, I, no offense, Dean, I don't think you deserve it. You still have it pretty good in Australia compared to a lot of the world. And, and so to someone who says, how can I help? Um, I would suggest two things, and I think Dean would be on, on board with this. Uh, one is to look out for people in your life, in your community, people who you can connect to directly right now, especially those suffering mental health consequences from lack of access to health care, medication, or just from isolation aggravating existing mental health issues, and connecting with people in your community who are suffering economically in order to uh, alleviate that directly in your community by being just a more conscientious economic actor right now. But then look to the long run. Don't send letters or emails or call your congressman or beg for change or any of that bullshit. Think ahead. Think way ahead. And to this, I go back to what Dean and I are doing in independent media. Change the paradigm. Change how people think. Raise awareness so this can't happen again. And on a practical level, do your best to live by these values and set an example. And this is where Dean and I, with our Micronation project, saying, hey, I'm on 10 acres here in the mountains of Arizona. My wife and I, fuck y'all. We're sovereign. We're going to do our own thing. We don't even, you know, you want to walk around without a mask? There's a country that doesn't acknowledge any of this bullshit. You can come hang out in Gardenia and, and we will respect your freedom in this constitutional propertarian monarchy where... King Adam Charles Kokesh the first rules. And, and and I'm sorry for a long answer that I thought I could get a quicker one out. But Dean, I think um, you, you had that hesitation. Like, I, I don't want to fight the, the, these immediate policies or this rising tide of bullshit, right? Mate, look, and, and this is where you're a bit further along in your, your journey is, you, you know, you've, you've been fighting it for a lot longer. I'm a lot newer to the sport. So I look at it and I think, you know, like, yeah, how, how are the different ways? What are the different things you can do to, to, to do to help? So, mate, look, and this is, you know, I, I actually downloaded your book the other day and I've been listening to it. And, you know, and, and, you know, and I do that with guys like Larry Sharp, Ron Paul, all the usual suspects. And I think it's just important for us to unite as much as possible. But you're 100% right. The Australians compared to digging graves for, for coronavirus victims. And let's be fair, you know, like if you were eaten by a shark at the moment and you had COVID-19 in your system, they'd turn around and declare you were death by COVID-19. Don't worry about those bite marks. That's complete. No, it was COVID. You know, it's just mental. Oh, uh, yeah, that reminds me of my favourite uh, case and the favourite tragedy in the United States. You probably heard uh, there was a guy skydiving and his parachute, parachute did not open. And, and right before he hit the ground, he died of COVID-19. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's get that super chat back up on screen. And then I think we'll do time for, uh, we'll make time for one more. All right. Kimberly Wood asks with a $5 super chat, how can we support the libertarians over there in Australia? Now, Kim, before, before I turn this to Dean, Dean, I think this is an exciting question where, you know, you complained about the name of your party. I, it's like, why not change the name to libertarian party? And we can have a, you know, an international union uh, of libertarian parties. And, and Kim, I'm excited about this conversation, uh, you know, being cross borders, but I think if the libertarian parties of the world created a stronger network, we could have a lot more of these, uh, you know, international conversations. But specifically uh, to Australia, to the liberal democratic party, as they call themselves over there, is, is there something, yeah, aside from donating and like, I, I think, 
the other, I mean, Kim, I'm sorry to answer the question for Dean again, but there's the obvious stuff you can donate and share social media, right? Anything else in particular? Well, mate, obviously I'm working with the, the this Resolute TV project and that's sort of my little, um, a bit like that's my Adam versus the man sort of program. Um, the, the Liberal Democrats Party, uh, and there is a UK version that are very, very socialisty. Um, look at that. Jeez, I'm not, I'm so pretty. <laughs> but uh, the Liberal Democrats Party, you know, look, they're a legitimate party. They're doing the real thing. Obviously, try to support them wherever you can. The Resolute TV project is, um, it's mine, it's small, it's modest, but it's growing. And I'm sort of doing the same, same sort of thing here. I'm trying to find other libertarians that I can support and promote. It's important for me to be able to promote somebody like Adam to Australians who may never have heard of Adam Kakesh or or Dan Berman or Joe Jorgensen. There's still people in the libertarian movement over here that don't realise we have a candidate in the in the election because their idea of libertarianism is they're out in the paddock and they're not interested in the political side of it. And I fully understand that. So, you know, I mean, it, it, and you're 100% right, the more the more sharing and, and united front that we can put forward saying that freedom is actually really, really valuable and far more important than, you know, freedom is more, more important than safety, 100, 100 times out of 100. And the current climate of, of life is telling us that, no, we're, we're not going to get any safety whatsoever out of all these, all these governments. Um, they're just taking freedom by freedom by freedom and, and people are losing their lives over absolute nonsense. It's terrifying. All right, Dean, you mind giving us, uh, let's see, one more comment here. All right, our last one today, another super chat from Rob. Dean, I demand you claim an extra half a point for our superannuation death tax. <laughs> Rob's, Rob was, uh, Rob's the best campaign manager in the world ever. He actually managed one of my campaigns up in the electorate of Lynn um, in, a, in the last lot of big federal elections. So, Rob, you're a superstar, mate. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the superannuation death tax. Our superannuation is like your 401ks. And, yes, they tax that as well. All right. <laughs> All right, Dean. Well, I hope you don't mind. We have one $50 super chat, someone who really wants to be on the show. Braden Matthews writes, In Canada, we are compared to our Australian brothers and sisters a lot in culture. So far, we have not had the military or the massive police state. How rapidly did things change for you guys? And what are the warning signs to watch for? That's a, that's a really good question. Now, we had an interesting lead into COVID. Um, you guys have bushfires and stuff over there. Well, we had a big bushfire catastrophe here um, around January, February. So we were already all very, very heightened. And we were already starting to hand over. Sorry? About that, I remember covering that and seeing that Hollywood was really getting behind the relief effort. Let's send money to Australian farmers. And then I did the research and I was like, this is another overblown crisis. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you guys have brush fires on a regular basis and this was a bad year, but not even a significantly bad year in historic terms. Is that... Is that fair? Uh, his, uh, look, his, his, uh, it's, it's a bit of both, mate. And I'll tell you why, because we did lose probably more more property and there, there was a massive, massive toll. It was a big deal. Um, it was probably we, – we've had a couple in modern history, but we do have them all the time, sure. What what I'm, I'm in the process of doing a video at the moment um, trying to dissect the fact that, that the word crisis is used, um, you know, far too often for far too many insignificant things. The bushfires were really, really dangerous. They were full on and I had an awful lot of friends and family that were really, really closely affected. Uh, at the time where I was living was on high alert for, for quite a period of time. So uh, yeah, there, was, there was an awful lot. There was an awful lot. We had firefighters die, even a couple of American firefighters that came over here and, and served and tried to help out died in, in process. Um, so we actually lost American firefighters during our bushfire uh, catastrophe. So, uh, yeah, look, it, it was pretty bad. But what it also did, and our Prime Minister at the time went on holidays to Hawaii um, while, while the crisis was on, so his leadership's been questioned ever since until coronavirus happened. And then all of a sudden he's now the, the man again because he's kept everyone really safe. But we were on heightened alert after the bushfires. So we had obviously, oh, well, we've got to get the military out. We've got to get everybody out and go and, you know, save all these people and, and do all these things. So 
we sort of had this inkling and on the news every day, you know, there was already the red flashing lights and the and we know what mainstream media is like. It was coming at everybody um, really aggressively that, you know, that we're in danger, we're in danger, we're in danger. We need to, we need to, you know, hand this over to the government. We're going to get the militaries out. They're going to come and protect you. And we, so we had that lead into coronavirus. So by the time that all subsided and then this, at the same time, this virus started coming out of China at, you know, what, December, January, it started becoming a thing. Our guys kind of just rolled over. Well, oh, well now, we're, now we're starting to take away your freedoms, freedoms this way and this way. I mean, we still haven't, I don't think, um, unless something dramatic happened, over, I don't think we've had a 1,000 people that have died of coronavirus in Australia yet out of 26 million people. Yet we've got people living or living locked up in their in their homes and locked up in uh, forced quarantine. So, what what do you do to avoid it? What are you looking out for? Uh, any anything mainstream that encourages people to dob in your neighbour? That's that's happening at the moment for coronavirus things. Um, you know, if you see somebody without a mask, you need to report them. If you see somebody outside the five k zone, you need to report them. There's people out and about without permission. Um, there's an awful lot to watch for. It's very interesting how to articulate it because there's just so many little nuances that they do. Uh, you know, Facebook posts, sorry you can't post about this. They bring in new laws. Uh, every time there's a crisis, the first thing I say to people is, don't watch what they're doing on the media. See what laws are being passed through Parliament while that's going on. You know, so we had a lot. We, they've been trying to push through cash bans in Australia at the same time as this has been going on. So they want to bring it in to be illegal for citizens to have more than $10,000 in cash because obviously you're a criminal who's trading in illegal cash if you have more than $10,000. Now, that sort of got a big push through while everybody's watching bushfires, coronavirus and all the rest of it. And you don't want to be paranoid, but I don't trust them. So I try to watch a bit of both. I try to keep an eye on... I try to keep an eye on every time they pull a freedom away because it might seem like a really insignificant small freedom. Do you guys have bicycle helmet laws, Adam? Uh, in some cities. Okay. So, you know, like in Australia, if you ride a bicycle anywhere, if you don't have a helmet on, there's a fine. You know, and, and every little, every, yeah, nationally. And so every little one of those things that they take away from you is setting them up to be more powerful and have more control over you when, when it suits them. So the lockdowns over here, they came in very, very quickly. Right, you're all locked down. But everybody was in such a state of panic and hysteria. I had, and I was instantly going, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. We've had bugger all deaths. This is overcooked. This is really not, it doesn't add up to my, in, you know, in my head, it didn't add up. And the way they went about it didn't add up from, from day one. And I made it fairly public. Um, but I had people arguing with me, black and no, it's for our own safety. We have to do it. We have to do it. The government's doing the best thing for us. During the bushfires, our government was the worst bunch of bastards on planet Earth, according to these people, because our Prime Minister went on holiday to Hawaii. Three months later, he's a national hero for locking us all up. And now the way it's all sort of working is um, this this Premier down in Victoria is doing very similar things, and, and, and he's still being praised. So there are people locked up. There is all this stuff going on, and they're still praising this guy who is unashamedly a communist. Um, he actually, there was a quote attributed to him very recently saying that it's very selfish to be concerned about your own personal freedoms at this time. Um, what do you do? You know, like really, we can we can just keep keep the good fight and keep pushing forward, but this is what we're dealing with. Well, I appreciate that super chat very much. Thank you, brother, for that perspective from Canada and reminding us that there are developed nations that haven't gone so far down the communist rabbit hole or at least the militarist police state rabbit hole, although I imagine Canada would score pretty high on the how communist are you scale contest here. We might have to get Tim Moen, the uh, the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada, on to play this game next. Dean, I appreciate you taking the time and, and, and bearing with us today. Uh, any final thoughts or, or things you want people to know about how to connect with you? Mate, connect with me any way you, any way you like. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Twitter, though. I'm only just starting to get into the whole Twitter sphere thing. Uh, obviously, the Resolute TV stuff, any support there. I'm pretty sure anybody who's interested in the Adam Kokesh show will find that interesting. Uh, you know, it's, 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 this is the vibe of people that we do. Yeah, most of my stuff's Freedom Chef related, so I'm a professional chef, so that's kind of 
kind of how we roll. Um, yeah, look, Adam, thank you for the one for the love, for coming on Resolute and supporting Dia and having me on here. Uh, really appreciate us. We, we just, I feel like we all need to stick together in the freedom movement and watching libertarians argue over who's more or less, less libertarians, just a, a negative negative context because we're all on a different layer level of journey and I appreciate you. You've sort of become a bit of a mentor over even the last few weeks, which I really appreciate. So thank you so much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to the people who love and believe in freedom. We need to hold on to this for dear life. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us from all the way in Australia this morning at a very early hour there, Dean. All right.